Hello and thank you for choosing to worship here with us at First at Firewheel Online. We believe that even though we can't meet in our physical building right now, God can still move in each one of our lives and we can come together and worship Him. That's right. You know, over the past several months, I've had the privilege of coming before you guys and talking about all the good we're doing in, in our local community. But right now we have a, a short video to just kind of say a thank you and we appreciate you from Convoy of Hope, one of our U.S. missions organizations that we sponsor that have gone all throughout the United States and throughout the world to make sure people have food, shelter, clothing, and all of the basic necessities. This is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope, and I wanted to give you an update on our response to the coronavirus. As you know, our disaster relief teams have responded to hundreds of disasters and crises across the United States and around the world. But this is a crisis unlike any other because of its pandemic magnitude. We're fielding urgent requests for truckloads of food and supplies from all over the country. But please know this, that we're going to do all we can to make sure that the basic needs of children and their families are met. We're also concerned for the elderly who are facing even higher risk right now. And we're concerned for the millions of citizens who are in jeopardy of losing their only source of income because businesses are closing. That's compounded by the fact that many stores are short of supplies and their shelves are bare. In response, Convoy of Hope, with your help, has begun the deployment of 50 tractor trailers filled with food and supplies to communities all over the nation. That will provide immediate help to more than 80,000 people. But we all know that much more is needed. As you can imagine, even our major providers of food and water and supplies are being stretched to meet public demand. But because of our long-standing partnership with these corporations, they've agreed to sell us product at below wholesale prices. So with your help, we're going to continue working hard to get food and supplies to those who need it most. Thank you again for your trust. Thank you so much for caring and giving, and God bless you. On the screen now, there are four ways you can help First at Firewheel reach into our community, continue to support our missionaries, and help complete our 2020 transformation campaign. Text FIREWILL TX to 77977. You can also visit firstatfirewheel.com and select the Giving tab. You can also give from the FAF Church app, available on iTunes and Google Play. You can also send a check in the mail to First at Firewheel, 5500 Levon Drive, Garland, Texas, 75040. In addition to giving, you can also click like, share the video, and leave a comment in the section down below that helps us get God's love and His message of hope all throughout YouTube and Facebook. Here in just a moment, Pastor Hanks is coming to bring a message from Psalms 90, wisdom for life and death. But first, church, let's worship.
Well, good morning, friends. I'm so happy to be with you today. Uh, to you, especially first at Firewheel, I say greetings from our heart, Mary Lou and I, and we pray you're well and that you're enjoying the favor of God. So many changes this year, 2020, and rapidly continuing to change. Every day is new, different, just when we think we have something sorted out, uncertainties and more questions keep coming. It's certainly a time for wisdom from above. I want to speak to you today about wisdom for life and death. Wisdom from, for life and death. We're going to be looking at Psalm 90. So open your Bibles, please get them. Let's spend uh, some time together in Psalm 90. I'll also look at a number of other scriptures, particularly Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Psalm 90 and Ecclesiastes chapter 3 will be our primary passages today. Let's ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, how grateful we are that we can come to you. You said, if any person lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and upbraideth not. So we ask you for wisdom. We need your wisdom, divine wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, verse 15, the wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. And then the writer of uh, Proverbs, Solomon, tells us in uh, verse 7 of chapter 4, above all and before all, do this, get wisdom. That's the message paraphrase. Reminds me of the young bank president who had just been promoted and decided he'd make an appointment with his uh, predecessor. Uh, he walks in and he said, Sir, as you know, I lack a lot of the wisdom of the qualifications you already have for this job. I was wondering if you could share with me some of the keys to uh, being able to be successful in leading a bank like you have. Young man, he said, two words, good decisions. The young man responded, well, sir, thank you, but I'm wondering how do you know uh, when they are good decisions? Young man, one word, experience. I see, but may I ask another question, the young man said. Yes, he said, how do you get that experience? Two words, the older man said, bad decisions. <laughs> experience seems to come from those kinds of experiences. Well, the writer of Psalm 90 is Moses. Moses knew a lot about bad decisions. He had made his share of them in his lifetime. In fact, during the first 40 years of his life, he was in the palace, Pharaoh's palace. You recall some of the decisions that got him in major trouble. Then his next 40 years, he was a shepherd on the backside of the desert of, and he's serving Jethro, his father-in-law, as he's taking care of sheep. And again, then the next 40 years, he is making decisions leading the people of God, the children of Israel. Approximately, they say, two million people, and they're going through the wilderness. And so by the time he writes Psalm 90, he has both wisdom and experience because he had come through a lot of bad decisions. Now, I believe we can learn from a man like this, and so that's why I want us to spend some time gleaning from his writings in Psalm 90. And speaking of gleanings, I'm gleaning some of my thoughts today from Pastor Curry Pikert up in Michigan. When you read Billy Graham's last book, <clears throat> the title is Nearing Home. Billy Graham, of course, is a legend. He has touched millions of people and led them to Christ around the world. But he, he began his introduction of his last book with these words. I never thought I'd live to be this old. 
At this time, he was almost 93. All my life, I was taught how to die as a Christian, but no one ever taught me how I ought to live in the years before I die. I wish they had. Uh, I, wish they, I wish they had because I am an old man now, and believe me, it's not easy. Now, back to Moses. As he contemplates life and death, he writes about it in Psalm 90. And he begins this psalm with a proclamation of faith in verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now notice he used the word Lord. Lord is a Hebrew word, and Moses, by using that word, is celebrating God's majestic authority. He is proclaiming and acknowledging God's unquestionable sovereignty. He is the, the great first cause. He is the creator of the universe. And Moses references that in those short two verses. He is declaring what to, what to one and all for the whole world. God is my sovereign. God is my supreme master. He is the authority over my life. Now, remember Moses' situation as he's writing this. When he's making this proclamation, he's in the wilderness. He's not in the halls of Pharaoh where it's comfortable, where he has delicacies to eat. He has probably a good bed to sleep on. He's now in the wilderness leading the tribes of Israel. They're, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not in comfortable situations. They're roaming, they're living in tents, they're searching for food, for water, and God is having to provide that for them. There's no dwelling place in the desert or in the wilderness. So he lifts up his eyes and he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And then he, as he's recalling their history, he's remembering that God had always been home for Israel, generation after generation. So this is where he begins with the writing of his psalm. He alone, God, had been their dwelling place, their house, their comfort, their security. God is all of that, and Moses is acknowledging that. Now don't miss the wisdom in what Moses is saying. For centuries, of course, philosophers and others have looked at life in an attempt to draw concepts and conclusions about God. But Moses looked to God to draw conclusions about life. There's a world of difference. You see, that is a, a, a key principle for you and for me. We don't learn about God by searching life. We learn about life by searching God and becoming close to him in all of his relationships with us. Friends, it is God with, with whom we have to deal. It is God before whom our lives are being lived out. H.G. Wells made this poignant statement. If there is no God, nothing matters. If there is a God, nothing else matters. The Apostle Paul says almost the same thing in Colossians 1, verse 15, beginning, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Then he says in verse 3 of chapter 3, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So it is Jesus Christ with whom uh, we have to deal. It is Christ that we are in much need of 
of living our life before and with his strength, his power, and with the impartation of his divine wisdom. So as we contemplate life, this is the proclamation of faith that we need to begin with. Lord, you are my dwelling place. God, I'm at home with you. Now, especially during these times in which we live, this pandemic, we're navigating such a need for wisdom, feeling isolated, just like the children of Israel in the wilderness, separated from many resources, seemingly. And yet God is our home. God is our dwelling place. Because of this proclamation of faith, Moses could move on then to an acknowledgement of two infinite realities, two very vital realities. Notice verses 3 through 10. Let's unpack that for a moment. First, he recognizes the brevity and the uncertainty of life. You read uh, Numbers chapter 20, and we know that by this time, Miriam and Aaron, who were so uh, such key figures in Moses' life, they have already died. Moses knows this. Moses realizes that he soon also will die without entering the promised land. So Moses summarizes life in verses 3 through 6. Listen to what he says. You turn people back to dust. He's speaking to God saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. You see, the reality that Moses is showing to us is that our lives are limited by the swiftness of time, the brevity of life. It's true, isn't it? The older you get, the more <laughs> you wonder where all the time went, how rapidly it's flying by. Where did those years go when I look back in history of my life? Psychologists tell us that the primary subconscious concern of a person over 50 and above is preoccupation with his or her own death. That sounds morbid, I know, but we're wise to reflect on it and think about it. You see, we don't always talk about it or constantly think about it, but it's uh, proven by uh, studies of human behavior that it's always in the back of our mind. Why do you think there's such uh, a turmoil and uncertainty and fear, anxiety going on right now? Uh, this is one of the responses to COVID-19, the fear of death, fear of your life being cut short. And so the psychologists say that people, especially older, realize that time's flying by and they somehow want to uh, sew it down. There's so many things still in their bucket list that they have not been able to complete. And they're beginning to deal with the fact that they may not have time to accomplish all of that. There's something known also in the middle of life, especially after 50. And sometimes they call that the midlife crisis. People do goofy, crazy things because they're trying to deal with this subconscious uh, turmoil that's going on in their lives. Well, Moses recognized this. He said to God, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. So the first thing Moses helps us with is to get a grip on the brevity of life and the certainty of life and that part of life. But the second thing is the sure discipline and judgment of God. And we see that in verses 7 through 10. He says, we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow 
for they quickly pass and we fly away. You see, part of what is contributing to Moses' thinking in this thought process is the background with which he's recalling, he's remembering, because he remembers not only his own sin and how God had to deal with him, but he remembers the fall of mankind. After all, God, by his spirit, had him to write about it in the first five books, especially the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. He writes about the first five books we call the Pentateuch. Moses is the author, under the Holy Spirit, of course. But in Genesis, he writes about the curse of the fall of sin and death and how sin separates all of us from God and that apart from a Savior, we are eternally separated from God. So in verse 7, Moses says, Israel is consumed by your anger. This is God's inability to tolerate sin. This is God's inability to look the other way when it comes to sin. Now the root of that word anger is uh, nose, which is a noun. And it's, it's, it's a picture of a wild horse making snorting sounds at anger. And he says that when God is anger, Moses is saying that there's, there's this manifestation like the snorting of a wild horse. And Moses says, we're terrified by your indignation. You see, apart from a savior, apart from the love of God, apart from the grace of God, it is a terrifying thing to approach God with our sin or to try to continue to live our life in sin without God. It's terrifying. Oh, thank God for a Savior. So Moses acknowledges this and he also acknowledges that our lives are limited by this sin. This is the same thing that uh, the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, chapter 3, verse 15, whatever is, has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. You see, because of sin, there will come a day when you and I will um, put, will stand before God and give an account for our life. God will put an end to our time as we know it. It will be by the trumpet sound and the rapture, or it will be by way of the grave. And you will breathe your last. I will breathe my last. No, uh, Moses is acknowledging this. You see, when that comes, when that time comes, which the writer of Ecclesiastes is, is, is telling us about. All, all calendars will be frozen. Our social media accounts will stop being updated. Planning calendars will lie unfulfilled. And everything will come to a screeching halt, as the old saying goes, because there will be no more time for you or for me in the moment and in the hour of death. Verse 10 again reminds us, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. Is it any wonder that Moses is asking God for wisdom? Is it any wonder that you and I must open our hearts to the wisdom of God. Now, the third thing we learn from Moses is from his prayers and his petitions for that wisdom. Moses was wise enough to ask God for wisdom. And so he seeks God's perspective. He wants to see things from God's point of view. And then this will prepare him to choose and make better choices for the days that are yet before him. Remember the TV show, Let's Make a Deal? The contestants, of course, needed to 
uh, choose what's behind door number one, door number two, door number three. If they only knew what was behind that door, then their choice would have been much easier and they would have been much more content with the outcome. Well, verse 11 says, if only we knew the power of your anger. You see, we don't know the power of God's vengeance on unconfessed sin, on a life that is insisted on being lived in rebellion against God. We do not know that, and this is not to be harsh or unkind, but it's to raise the warning flag and sound the alarm. If there's any attempt in any heart listening to me today to live separated from God, that you can figure it all out apart from the wisdom of God, I urge you, turn around. That word is called repentance. Change course. Get things right with God. So Moses is praying before God. Now the first thing Moses asks is teach us. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You see, logically, you would possibly not put those concepts together. Thinking about, examining, being fully aware of the brevity of your life is connected somehow to a life of wisdom. This is what Moses is teaching us. He understood the importance of living our lives every day to the full, but in the light of God's eternal wisdom. It means that we are using our time and we're valuing our time and living it out in the way that would fulfill the purposes of God for our life. We seek Him first. We want to please Him first. James M. Boyce made a wise comment and he wrote it, we cannot apply our hearts unto wisdom as instructed by Moses, except we number every day as our possible last day. And Ecclesiastes 3 tells us in verse 1, reminds us that God created time and God orders the parts of time and certain durations of time. And he does that in our lives as individuals. Oh yes, he's fully capable of doing that with, with the billions of people who live on this planet, those who are followers of Christ, those who follow God, he's fully able to order their steps. There are times for birth, he tells us, and there are times for death. There are times for planting. There are times for harvesting. There are times for weeping. There are times for laughing and celebration. So this is the divine rhythm to life that God is giving us, and it's all under the control of the divine hand of God because with Moses we proclaim, God, you are our dwelling place. You are our home. We live and move and have our being in you because we can't control these events. We can't control these rhythms of life, the weeping, the, the joy, the planting, the harvesting. Oh, we may think we can, but perish the thought. Get over it. No, it's beyond your control. It's beyond mine. We must rely on Him. We must walk with Him. We need to trust God and keep our hand in His hand. Solomon said He has made everything beautiful in its time. So everything that happens, God either plans it or God permits it in our lives. The Apostle Paul wrote later, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so the second thing we learn from Moses that, and his petition is to satisfy us. You see this in verses 13 through 16. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us. There's the prayer. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as we have you have afflicted us. 
for as many years as you have, we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your, splendid, your splendor to your children. Yes, our days are limited by brevity, and yes, they are impacted by the vengeance and the discipline of God. But remember, God is our dwelling place. We live under the covenant of his love if we have embraced faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there, under the covenant of his eternal love, we can be satisfied. We can find fulfillment. We can have joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Yes, difficult times can and will come, but he is our dwelling place. Mark Henninger was a young businessman with a, with a freak accident changed his life, his wife, the whole family. Mark and his wife were plunged into the worst nightmare that any parent can imagine. Their little two-year-old toddler was out in the yard and the wife was backing out the car and uh, accidentally a wheel ran over that precious baby. She died in Mark's arms. He was so filled with grief initially. It was so deep. Mark said he had to ask God to help him breathe, to just eat, to get dressed, to just move about, to put one foot in front of the other. But slowly over time, as he trusted God and he leaned on the promise of God, God was working in his life and brought healing slowly restoration, even joy, and a new purpose in life. Yes, it took time. These are those rhythms we're talking about. But he trusted God. He kept his hand in God. Eventually, he left the business world and enrolled in seminary, answering a call to ministry. He became a pastor, and he now uses his own experience of devastation and sorrow and deep loss to minister to other hurting people who are going through very difficult times. And God's changed his life. Does it still hurt? Does, does he still have memories? You know the answer to that. But I want to tell you, here's what he says. Sometimes People scoff at the Bible saying that God can cause good to emerge from our pain if we run toward, toward him instead of away from him. But I've watched it happen in my own life. I've experienced God's goodness through deep pain and no skeptic can dispute that. The God whom the skeptic denies is the same God who held our hands in the deep dark places, who strengthened our marriage, who deepened our faith, who increased our reliance on him, who gave us two more children, and who infused our lives with new purpose and meaning so we can make a difference in the lives of other people. My friend, whatever you're going through, God is still our dwelling place. Let's learn from Moses. Let him teach us that. He can satisfy you regardless of what you are going through. And then finally, Moses petitions God to establish us. Ecclesiastes makes this comment about life in chapter 3, verse 22. So I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work, because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what is after him? Sounds uh, rather foreboding, doesn't it? But listen to the paradox in what Moses writes in verse 17 of Psalm 90. Here's the contrast. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish. You hear that word? Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You see, friends, in this context, we come to the realization and face the reality that in life we can either leave memories or we can leave a legacy. I said we can leave memories or we can leave a legacy. And it's owing to our choices 
and our response to the wisdom of God that he imparts to us as we walk with him and we live abundant life in the dwelling place of God as our habitation. French scientists succeeded in causing chickens to sound like quails. Amazing. They took tissue from the part of uh, a Japanese quail brain that controls the bird's call. And they implanted that into the brains of five chicken embryos. And the experiment worked. The researchers say that the hatched little chicks sounded just like quail rather than chickens because of the implant. Well, someone has suggested they weren't the first to do a brain in implant, a, a brain transplant, if you will. God has implemented into you as a follower of Christ, if you will, the mind of Christ. And in all who have uh, trusted Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. Paul says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. You see, it's by the Spirit that we now have a capacity for divine wisdom. And regardless of education, there's no PhD degree. There's no experience of human life that can qualify you for this apart from the work of the Spirit of God. Having the mind of Christ then enables us to see life increasingly from the viewpoint of God. And when we see things, we see life, we see what's going on from God's point of view, with his perspective. The definition of that is wisdom. And this is what God wants for you and for me. Yes, in these uncertain times, in this pandemic, God wants that. God wills that for you. So we can then, when he's finished with us, leave a God-glorifying God legacy, not just memories. We want to leave more than memories. And we can do that if we follow the will of God. We fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. You remember the fool in Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12. He was going to build bigger barns. He's got stuff to store. So he can enjoy life. He's just going to be, be, be happy, fat, and live out his life. And Jesus says this of him. You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? See, Jesus wanted him to leave a legacy. Not just memories of a successful farmer. And that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. He wants you to leave more than memories of being sharp, fulfilling uh, somebody else's uh, destiny, making people happy that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. God wants you to leave a legacy. And so we can do that by the grace of God. And we do that by choosing to do all we do to the glory of God. Every choice we make, every decision, every sacrifice, every inconvenience, let it all point to the fulfillment of the glory of Almighty God. And so I want to encourage you today to open your heart before God. Let Him pour fresh wisdom into your life. I want to encourage you to uh, let Him help you do that by asking some uh, pointed questions to yourself. Uh, how does what I'm considering doing next uh, do good for other people? How does what I'm considering benefit those who love me, who look up to me, who are uh, around me, or who are depending on me? How, how does it benefit the cause of Christ? Which is an even more important question. What are, what are the consequences of this course of action? What are the consequences of not going uh, this direction? Uh, will I regret this tomorrow? See, these are valuable questions to ask when you're seeking wisdom from above. And by sitting at the feet of 
Moses today, we in reality are sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he is teaching us by the living word of God to walk in the light of his wisdom from above. Yes, about life and also about death. And therefore, that's why Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, the one who has the power of death and the one who brings fear and torment about death. Jesus came to destroy his works. And he does that one way by imparting divine wisdom into your life and mine. So it's time that you and I give our life fully to the wisdom of God. It's time we, start, we stop worrying and start trusting Almighty God. It's time to lead children and young people into the presence of God like never before. It's time to rescue the perishing around us and to pick up the fallen and the marginalized and reach out in the love and the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to stop uh, seeking for and looking around for better soil it's time to just start sowing seed and doing something for the kingdom of God. It's time to stop looking for better bait. It's time to start fishing and doing something for Almighty God. It's, it's time now to stop talking about prayer. It's time to start praying and sincerely interceding before Almighty God. It's time to stop looking for excuses for our life and start making some commitments that we keep to Almighty God. It's time to stop playing being a Christian and it's time to be a devoted, committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving him your very all, your mind, your heart, your soul, your body, everything about you, your entire being. I belong to Jesus Christ because as Moses has said, my dwelling is with God. He is my dwelling place. He is my home. I live and I move and I have my being in Him. It's really an eternal choice. And you will always create either a memory or a legacy by what you do now in this present moment. So don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Choose Him. Choose Jesus Christ. And God will give you wisdom for life and for death. It's his promise, and he watches over his word to perform it. May I pray with you? Let's thank him together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, dear God. You are our dwelling place, and we love you. Thank you for feeding us with your word today. Thank you for inspiring us, giving us new hope, energizing our faith to stand on your word, to trust you, living God, Never mind what's going on in our world. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we look to you today. I bless those who are hearing me today. I ask you to give them the courage to make the decision they need to make now, in this very moment. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. May his peace go before you. And may he lead you day by day by his spirit, amen. Pastor Hanks, thank you for that challenging message, wisdom for life and death. One of the wisest decisions that you can make is to place your life in the hands of Jesus. In the church, we call that uh, become, being saved or giving your life to Christ. Ultimately, it means that you are surrendering control of your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you've never done that before, or maybe there was a point in your life where you did that and you have walked away, I would love the opportunity to pray with you right now in leading you in back into that relationship with Jesus. Would you just take a moment and bow your head? And you don't have to bow your head. You don't have to close your eyes. That's just what I'm going to do. But just repeat these words after me, if that is you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for my sin. I believe that Jesus was your only son and that you raised him from the dead after he was beaten and killed for the punishment of my sin. I give you complete control of my life 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. And let me be the first to say congratulations. The Bible also tells us that right now up in heaven, all of heaven is rejoicing. The angels are throwing a big celebration, a big party, because you just crossed over from death into life. Church, let's celebrate with those individuals who just gave their life to Jesus. Don't forget, the four ways that you can give to First at Firewheel are on the screen right now. Church, have a great day loving God, loving people, and loving life. God bless.